All right, so we are now in Heritage Hall next to what we call our office case, which was designed to help us evoke the idea of the old departmental offices that would have been in the building. So to remind you where we are talking about, the Superintendent of Public Instruction's office was in the West Wing, that's the back wing of the Capitol, on the first floor. And they were actually in the Northwest corner initially. And as we were putting together this case, we actually used a superintendent's of public instruction photograph that was taken about 1893 to help inform our decisions that we made about carpeting and the wall fields and furniture arrangement and if it would be appropriate to incorporate things like a telephone or a typewriter and so on. In fact, to be honest, this is a photograph we have used a lot over the years, and I'm very grateful that Henry Pattengill or whomever um, decided to have it taken because it gives us a great context for what those office interiors were like and also what the staff was like. Now we can go back into the records and we can actually learn more about those individual staff and we'll talk about them in a bit when we get upstairs. But as you take a look at this photo, you will see that we can actually compare it with an inventory of the Capitol taken about the same time and so we can even dial down as far as how many chairs there were in this space and the number of typewriters and they had a mimeograph machine in here early on. And it's a reminder of the physical work that's being done. These are workspaces. So yes, it looks very pretty. I'm sure they cleaned off their desks before they took this photo. Um, but this was a place of work. And to that end, in this inventory, there are bookcases listed. So we included a bookcase in this iteration of the office case. And if you look really carefully, um, the bookcase that we have here actually includes copies of the Michigan Pioneer Collections. Because part of what the Superintendent of Public Instruction was trying to do, along with others in Michigan, was ascertain what materials we should be teaching. And then, as now, there was a robust discussion about state history. How should we teach history? For that matter, how should Michigan be writing its own history? There was a big push in the late 19th century to try to start to write the history of Michigan, specifically that pioneer generation. And to be frank, not all of this came in textbook form. What we have here is a full set of the Michigan Pioneer Collection, which was put together by the Michigan Pioneer Society. It's a collection of monographs, um, reminiscences, biographical sketches, uh, short memoirs, of people who came to Michigan in, quote unquote, the pioneer phase, which often means around the time of statehood in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. The first edition of the Pioneer Collection started to be published in the 1870s, but the Superintendent of Public Instruction actually worked with the pioneers to have a second edition printed starting about 1900 with the idea that the state would provide free copies of these that could be sent out to schools. So this is part of that ongoing effort to send good materials to schools that can be used to teach very specific things like Michigan history. And you have to remember, there were teachers coming in and out of this office. It wasn't just state employees typing up letters and postcards and sending missives out into the world. We know that there were teachers coming to the office actually to take exams even. And I'm gonna shift over to Cam for a second to talk about those. Yeah, so there were exams that were held in the Capitol building for teacher certification. Um, it's a little bit different than certification today. Um, in the 1880s, there were actually different levels of certification. And most teachers would have gotten their certification at county exams that would have been given um, in, in their area of the state. However, those county exams allowed you to get certification at what they called either a first grade, second grade, or third grade level. Um, first grade was that you could teach in all of the different schools throughout the county, um, and it was valid for a certain number of years. Second grade was valid, I think, for two years within the county. Um, a third grade certificate was kind of the equivalent of the ability to be a substitute teacher. You could teach up to six weeks in a year. Um, now, if you were coming to Lansing to take a test, that was actually gonna be a test with the superintendent of public instruction that would qualify you for a lifetime teaching certificate and you could teach in any school in the state of Michigan with that. Um, at a certain point in time, um, the uh, Board of Education then also becomes responsible for um, 
issuing some of these um, certificates as well, and those would be lifetime certificates as well. And you can see in the Lansing newspapers where teachers are scheduling time, sometimes multiple days in a row, to come in and take these exams. Likewise, around the holidays, between Christmas and New Year's, when schools back then would have had a break, as we still do today, there were also annual teachers' institutes held at the Capitol. And this goes back, actually, to the second Capitol, that wooden building. Starting, I believe, in the 1850s, teachers from across Michigan, um, at all levels, sometimes they are what we would today consider elementary schools, all the way through the university and the colleges, they would get together and they would share best practices. Uh, people would give presentations. This is basically a conference. And because the Capitol is kind of a central meeting point, and because the superintendent of public instruction can book rooms in it, including the House or Senate chambers, these become natural gathering spaces. And it's really interesting to go through and to look at the topics they were discussing. In the 1850s, 1860s, there were some fiery speeches given about co-education. So should boys and girls be educated together? Um, in the 1880s, one of the topics that we know they were discussing one year was what can the teacher do to ensure in the future a higher standard of political morality? Gee, that sounds like an apt topic today or then. We also know that they were talking about the scope of college education, uh, the limitations of college work, um, college discipline. So there's a lot of discussions going on, and those are happening in the Capitol. And I have no doubt that those conferences were planned out of the superintendent of public instruction's office. And there was a, probably a lot of running back and forth between the chambers upstairs and between that office, which would have been their home base. So you see not only things going out from the Capitol to teachers, but you see teachers coming to the Capitol to converse and talk together. Now, before we jump into more topics here, I do want to jump back to one of our snapshots on education, just so we can see what the state of education is in Michigan when this building opens. We're up to over 6,000 school districts in the state, 362,000 plus students in the state, and we have increased the length of the school year. We're averaging about 7.5 months a year at that point in time. Major issues that appear in superintendent reports from the era is high teacher turnover, um, and then money from the library is actually to be, being diverted to regular operating costs of schools. And then there was a big to-do about discrepancies between the laws on the books. A lot of laws had been passed, and some of them didn't quite say the same things as other ones did. So there was a big push from the superintendent of public instruction to then um, take a look at all these laws and try and make a more cohesive school code. Um, and then finally, there's a big push to consolidate schools at the township level. Um, they're starting to realize that having so many school districts in Michigan were not allowing for um, a high enough pay for teachers. And so maybe by combining some of these smaller schools and maybe combining so that each township has just one school instead of multiple districts, that you could then hire more teachers or hire teachers at a better pay and have classrooms that would have a few more students so your tax base would be a little higher there. So throughout the 1880s and 1890s, major changes in education. Um, we actually um, increase our compulsory education laws in the state. In 1883, we extend compulsory education to four months out of the year for students. In 1889, a free textbook law comes into place. Um, this only applied to certain cities, but is going to start helping with that um, discrepancy and all these students having different textbooks um, throughout the year and within the same classrooms. Um, we get our first kindergarten certifications and certifications for music teachers and art teachers. And then we get some new, um, new institutions, the Michigan or the Girls Reform School opens in Adrian. Um, there's a separate school for the blind that's open. And then in 1893, we get the Michigan Home for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic that's established. Um, and that is really the first time the state's gonna step into education for the mentally disabled. So this is um, these are some big things that are happening in the 1880s and 1890s. And there's one particular person that we should talk about when we're talking about education in the 1880s and 1890s. And that's Henry Pattengill, um, one of our most well-known superintendents of public instruction. Um, a quote from a fellow superintendent in Michigan said, since the days of Father Pierce, and remember, he's our first superintendent of public instruction. Since the days of Father Pierce, 
Perhaps no man has left a deeper impress on the affairs of education than he whose good wit and hearty sympathy have won him hosts of friends throughout the state and made him welcome at every teacher's gathering within its bounds. So Henry Pattengill, he was born in 1852 in Mount Vernon, New York. As a young child, he was actually injured in a farming accident. He was thrown from a horse and a reaper that the horse was pulling ran over his leg. He was actually thought that he was going to... Um, he was not going to survive, and the doctor didn't set his leg. When he was still alive a day later, his parents sent for another doctor who did set his leg, um, and he very slowly recovered. But he was bedridden for months and took up reading. Eventually, he went to the University of Michigan. Um, he was a superintendent of schools at St. Louis, Michigan, and Ithaca schools. Um, was the editor of the Michigan School Moderator, which he ended up buying. Um, was a professor at Michigan Agricultural College before becoming superintendent of public instruction. Now, he is very involved in a lot of those changes I just mentioned. Um, some of his policies that he was particularly adamant about was compulsory education in schools. As I mentioned, that did expand um, during that era. He was a big proponent of teaching history and current events, um, and he actually would write um, some school textbooks. So we have civil government in Michigan in the case here, which is by Henry Pattengill about teaching how the government in Michigan works. Um, he was a big proponent of free textbooks. And so um, he writes other things that are distributed, distributed throughout the schools, including one over here, Pat's Picks was actually a song book. He compiled some of his favorite songs he thought would be educational for students, printed them at a very low cost to distribute to the school so you could buy a whole school set, have assemblies, and everybody sing together and learn at the same time. Um, he was a big supporter of that consolidation of schools on the township model, and he was a big supporter of athletics in schools and school libraries. He wanted there to be a notion of physical fitness within um, a classroom setting and wanting to improve every aspect of a child's life. Um, and then his other big thing, he was a big proponent that teacher training should be more stringent and there should be more requirements for teachers. He um, actually institutes a um, policy that those um, that certification, that grade three certification, which was like your substitute teacher certification, you could only get that twice before you had to pass the more stringent test to be a grade two teacher where you could teach for two years. So he's saying, we're not going to keep recertifying people for short periods of time. We, you need to kind of up your game and advance through the different levels of certification. So with that, um, we are going to head upstairs and actually take a look at the office where Henry Pattengill would have served. So we are now up in what is today room H151. So everything in the Capitol was last renumbered during the restoration in the early 1990s. Um, but for a long time, this area would have simply been part of the superintendent of public instruction suite. It was three rooms initially. We are in the easternmost room. And while we're here, I want to talk a little bit about other family members who worked in this office besides Henry Patton Gill. Because in this office, as with many places in the Capitol, there was a well-established tradition that once you have someone heading up a department, they get to bring family to come in and work with them. And in Henry's case, we know at least two family members worked here. One was a woman named Mary Johnson, who was actually his niece. Mary Johnson came to live with the family in Lansing and would have been considered sort of under her uncle's protection. Now, as part of this, family tradition states that she came to work with him and worked in the office. What's interesting is if you actually look at state records, you will see she never drew a salary. Um, salaries at that time were all, um, uh, all mark, uh, demarcated in the Auditor General's report, so we can see every single person who was working in each place. Um, and she's not there. So it is possible that she did this as sort of an extra pair of hands in the office when needed. It is also possible that it was considered to be something that she could do to offset the fact that the Pattengills were housing her and feeding her and covering her expenses while she was in town. We do actually see her in that photograph of the superintendent of public instruction's office. Um, she's going to be on the far right hand side, actually not too far from Henry Pattengill himself. We also know that Pattengill's sister-in-law, Norabelle Sharpstein, spent considerable time here. 
She comes in when her brother-in-law is serving, although she had spent plenty of time in Lansing before. We find newspaper notices of her visiting Lansing, for example, in the 1880s, because the Patton Guilds did leave, live here previous to his election. Um, but she actually is going to outlast her, her brother-in-law significantly. Um, she will work in this office until 1909, when she leaves to marry. And it's fascinating to think about how the office changed during her time here. She would have been here about 16 years. Uh, for example, we see that the number of people working in this office um, more than doubles, actually. And we can see that in some instances, she is the person who is administering those exams that are taking place here. So she seems to have been in somewhat of a leadership role. Um, we can also, thanks to these reports, track salaries. And if you do our programming, you may have heard this before, but it's very interesting to me always when I look at these salaries to see the rates at which men and women are being paid. And you will see that she is earning equal wages with the men with whom she is working. Now, one of the things she would have experienced in this office was actually the loss of this room where we are today. In the 1870s, the Grand Army of the Republic, a private organization, this was a, a um, veterans association for Union Civil War veterans, the Grand Army of the Republic has a lot of political clout in this era. And they are actually able to successfully petition the state to get custody of this room. So much to their chagrin, the superintendent of public instruction and staff is kicked out of this space. And this one room becomes where the GAR records are stored. Now it's hard to know exactly what these records are early on, but over time, state records regarding terms of service for Michigan military are transferred here and the number of records grows. So after the Spanish-American War, you can see where they take um, custodianship of Span Am records. Same thing happens after World War I. And the custodian of this space is often going to be a veteran himself. What's interesting is the GAR, which again is a private non-governmental group with an official capital room, they are able to stay in this space into the 1950s. And there are interesting records that suggest by that point in time, this was largely a center for, for genealogical research. So people were coming here to find out what their grandfather or what their great uncle did during the war and get copies of service records. So these would have been probably things like the Michigan Brown books or copies of Michigan in the war. Now, as a result of this, um, the superintendent of public instruction, who by 1909 has about 20 people working in this suite, are now down to two rooms. And it is possible that sometime in this era, around the 1890s, they actually subdivide the third space. So we initially have three rooms. They're now down to two. We think what happens is they take one of those rooms and they cut it in half. And you can see this in a later photograph that probably dates to the late 30s or early 40s. In this photograph, which is of the first floor office, the far western room, you can see a wooden divider that has been built in. It has some beautiful etched glass. This is clearly a 19th century modification from the look of it. It's possible this would have been put in to separate a private office for the superintendent versus the deputy superintendent or it's possible this was put in so they could still have three different workspaces even when they were down to two rooms. Think of it as a very Victorian version of a cubicle, if you will. So we're now in that the central space of the suite of rooms here. And I wanna take another brief minute to just get a little bit of our snapshot on education here. So this is from 1900 to 1940. Um, what we get happening over this time period, we get again, an increase in the number of school districts up until about 1920, when we get hit, hit a peak of over 7,000 school districts within the state. Um, after that point in time though, those, the number of school districts will gradually start to fall. There is a lot bigger push towards consolidation of schools. Certain legislation gets written, and that helps that push towards a more consolidated school district. And a lot of um, defunct school districts are actually being dissolved um, so that 
frees up those taxpayers to go to these other larger districts. Um, we also get an increase in the amount of schooling, but that's starting to flatten out to be around eight months out of the year um, through this era. And we have a lot more courses of education that are coming in and becoming popular. Things like manual training courses, like shop classes and home ec, um, become something that we want to teach within the schools. The Department of Education, the, the um, Superintendent of Public Instructions Office, takes over responsibilities for building of schools. So um, initially, they're going to issue building plans for different school types to schools. So if you want a one-room schoolhouse, here's the plan for your building. If you want a two-room schoolhouse, here's a series of three plans you can pick from. Um, but eventually, they'll start taking over and doing a lot more of that where they're actually working with school districts to, co to coordinate the whole building process. Um, by the 1940s, we're getting a big push towards vocational training to help in defense industries um, for the war. Um, and so throughout this period of time, um, we get a lot more different legislation. Um, in um, 1917, we get our first adult education classes that are formed. Um, also in 1917, as we're consolidating these schools down, we now need to figure out how we're going to transport kids further distances. So transportation becomes something that the school districts have to take on. Um, we get interscholastic athletics that are organized under the Superintendent of Public Instructions Office in 1923. Um, we, and also in 1923, um, physically handicapped students start having day programs within their own school district rather than just having residential programs. And that's something that's going to start happening. More and more different um, different kinds of classes are going to be offered at your average school district, which is something they can do as they're consolidating into bigger schools. Um, we get new teacher certification laws and a complete restructuring of the school system throughout this era. And so as more and more responsibilities are coming on more and more districts, the superintendent of public instructions office, they end up breaking up into different divisions, a printing division to send out um, information on new educational practices, um, divisions that are going to deal with these different types of programs and helping the school districts implement them. And that means more staff in the offices here. And we now have more offices because the tenants across the hallway, the Board of Health, which becomes the Department of Health, and also the Railroad Commission, which I believe is an ancestor of what we today call MDOT, the Michigan Department of Transportation, they eventually relocate out of the Capitol. Um, the Board of Health will move over to the state office block for a few years, and then they will move in this new state office building when that opens up in the 1920s. So just as the superintendent of public instruction saw someone grab their space, they decide to grab someone else's space. So they successfully petitioned the Board of State Auditors, who are still overseeing the Capitol, to acquire the offices across the room, which we are not going to actually visit today. Um, that will be another tour for another time. But we will take a look at some snapshots of that new floor plan, which you can see here, courtesy of a 1943 survey of the Capitol. So they have pretty much doubled their space now. In fact, more than doubled because they have four rooms on the other side they can now use. We can also see that by the early 1940s, they have moved some of their staff down. So remember, our first floor offices tend to grow down into the ground floor space below. They are, though, only able to capture some of that ground floor footprint. They do not manage to get the space underneath the offices across the way. Those are going to be divided by the superintendent of the Capitol, that's Capitol Facilities, and the Auditor General staff. It is absolutely mind-boggling, though, when you look at the statistics, um, the survey that went with these floor plans, you can see that um, you have over 20 people working in just one or two rooms. And there are a series of photographs, again, we think these are probably from the late 30s, early 40s, that show people packed in tight. You know, today, there's a big discussion about whether or not it makes sense for people to be in individual offices, or do we use cubicles? Do we have open floor plans? Well, open floor plan was the only option at this point in time. And you can see looking at these photographs, people quite literally sharing desks. It's as though we have long counters with one person next to another, next to another. And you can also see in some of the images, um, large bookshelves where they're storing records, 
keep in mind, part of what the superintendent and staff are doing is they are keeping records on not only all of the schools in Michigan, but all of the students, all of the families attending the public schools. So this is a massive amount of paper. In fact, if you look at the inventories um, for one of the spaces, it is referred to as the library, and it doesn't even include how many bookcases there are. It just says full. And in this era, full meant very, very, very full. We also do have one photograph of the ground floor space down beneath us. Um, if you look carefully, you will see this was clearly the westernmost room in that suite based on the stairs that you can see through the window. Um, and you can see three women here. This is in the era in which you see the majority of Capitol staff are now female. Overall though, during World War II, Capitol staffing levels do go down slightly in part because some members probably enlisted and left to fight, whereas others may have left to work in the defense industry. So just as we're talking about manual training for students to be able to support the defense industry once they graduate and go into the workforce, um, so we see capital employees potentially doing the same thing. And it's of course a reminder that whatever happens in this building is affected by culture as a whole and by broader movements in America and across the world. So we are now in the third room of the suite, which today is actually where the member office is. These became legislative offices in the 1960s. So today this suite is used by the House Majority Floor Leader, though we are getting a bit ahead of our timeline here. If we go back to the 1950s for a moment, while well, the superintendent was still working in here and across the hall, um, we have to pause and acknowledge that the superintendent and his staff were some of the first to commit the sin of overflooring in the Capitol building. It did not happen in this specific room. According to the 1957 floor plans we have, it happened across the way. But because you have so much staff, because you have so many records and you need that storage room, they start putting in half floors in the 1940s. So this was not something that happened only when the legislature took over the building. This was something departments were doing as well. So before we conclude today, I do want to bring us up to the 1960s with our snapshots on education. By the 1960s, we've greatly decreased the number of school districts within the state, state about 2,144 by 1960, but we have over a million students. So a lot more students, but a lot fewer school districts. Um, major issues in um, the 1960s superintendent of public instruction report was the need for more state support of schools, um, the need for higher pay for teachers, and um, the large increase in the number of students caused by the baby boom. And this was in all levels of education. Um, so along with that, we have a lot more, there's more restructuring in the 1950s and 60s of these schools. Like I said, we consolidate down. Um, there's actually a law that in three years time, will have the number of school districts in the state of Michigan down to 700. Um, this is passed in 1964. Um, and there's just a really big push to build more larger schools, things um, have more teacher training to accommodate more teachers, offer better salaries, to keep teachers for this upcoming flood of children that will be coming into the school system. Um, but you also get more federal involvement within the school system around this point in time too. Um, going back to the depression in World War II, you have the federal government starting to set up an Set, step in and set up child care centers and things like that for mothers um, who are going off into the work industry. And these are, in most instances, short-lived, but there also starts to become a push for more involvement in things like school lunches and providing um, support for students. And um, the National Defense um, Education Act puts federal dollars into the teaching of science, math, and foreign languages in an effort to um, get our population to the point where if there were to be a war with Russia, a nuclear war, we could kind of hold our own and hopefully triumph. So this is in that um, era where we're really concerned about um, in the Cold War era. So all of these things means that the state is now working with the federal government to ensure that the school districts and that the state is complying to receive those federal dollars. So the superintendent of public instructions office is taking on that role as well. 
And ultimately, by the mid-1960s, the superintendent of public instruction moves out of the Capitol. Um, they will work in a few different spaces around Lansing. And then finally, um, they will move into their own building. So just uh, beyond our walls here, we have the complex to the west of the Capitol. This is where a lot of the departments are still headquartered today. Ultimately, education will move back to what was initially called the South Ottawa Tower. Um, that would be renamed the John A. Hanna Building in 1991, not long after former MSU president John Hanna died. So it is interesting that um, from this office, you can still look out and see the building where the Department of Education is located today. And of course, we still talk a lot about education in this building. Um, this is part of what the state does. We fund education through the appropriations bills that are passed. Um, in fact, at the same time we are putting this video together, the governor's staff is preparing her budget proposal for the upcoming fiscal year. And of course, there is still legislation passed in the chambers upstairs that addresses certain things tied to education. So education is not gone from the Capitol. It is still very much at the center of part of what we do here. So thank you very much for joining us today. We hope that you have enjoyed this uh, glimpse into a lesser seen space of the Capitol, but also a step back to a history that is very easy to overlook. So with that, um, if you do have any questions for us, you are welcome to send us an email. That's the same email that some of you may use to sign up for our programming. It's capitaltourguides at legislature.mi.gov. Thank you again very much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Rise in Progress.